Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special anatomy movie. Today, we dissect Triple X, The Return of Xander, but we have a very special guest, so stay tuned. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Anatomy of a Movie. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. On today's Anatomy of a Movie, we're going to talk Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage, but in sort of our Instead of our full normal anatomy of movie, we have a very special guest, the costume designer of the movie, Kimberly A. Tillman. Hello. Hi, thank you. And of course, we have Dimitri Panos. Hey, movie fans, and hello, welcome. Hi. It's, 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 it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's Thanks an honor. for having me. Anytime thank anybody you. comes on our show, it's awesome. That's right. We always love these sort of episodes when we, when we have someone um, within the industry and we get to talk with them, whether it's um, John Ottman or anyone else, kind of uh, give us a nice break and really gives us an insight into um, not only the movie itself, but also the movie making process. So it's it's Great. a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Um, and so we'll do a little bit of mix. Um, this, this is more so for the fans. We'll do a mix of obviously talking about the movie, but we'll also kind of talk about your career and dive a little bit deeper in there. Great. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. Um, now, Dimitri, I know, uh, I want to I want to kick it off with you because you've, um, as you put it, you have a connection with Kimberly. So I want you to share what that means. Well, uh, yeah, we were talking before we came in here, and we sort of indirectly worked with one another uh, way back when um, a, a Universal classic. Uh, I was working at Universal uh, doing in-theater marketing, and I had to get the trailers up for this movie called uh, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. <laughs> this was the pairing, the, the magnificent uh. pairing of Sylvester Stallone and Golden Girl... Uh, Estelle Getty, uh, and um, and then I noticed in my research you were a costumer. You were telling me you were actually costume. Uh, I was the assistant, assistant to the costume designer. Yeah, and uh, I just found that like hysterical. What it's year like, was that? I believe that was uh, also when it, when I looked it up. I believe that was like ninety oh ninety two. Yeah. Yeah. And it was yeah. And ancient just, history. <laughs> ancient history. And I was like, going, oh, yeah. she actually worked on a movie that I had to uh, put the trailers and posters up. Uh, you know, in theaters, mm -hmm. and I thought that that was fascinating. And we were yeah. talking a little bit about, and you were talking about that it was uh, like fun mayhem. It was. I mean, Estelle Getty, she she goes <clears throat> way back. She's almost like vaudeville kind of yeah. gal, and she walks in and cracks jokes. And you know, she she played his mom, which she really should have been his grandma. But um, yeah, she was fun and funny. And actually, uh, Sylvester Stallone's gang was great. I mean, he's. He's got talk about loyal, right? We were talking about that earlier too. He's so loyal to his crew. He's got the same producers, the same drivers. He had a, has a costumer who's always with him, mm -hmm. and so I mean, I liked that. It was fun. I mean, I was a kid, you know. Yeah. It was super fun. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, um, uh, I was sort of prepping, so I didn't quite hear your full conversation off air. But I, um, you guys were also talking about sort of the importance of almost like a mentorship program, right? So you mentioned you were an assistant there, and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so what, what was some of the stuff that you learned that would eventually help you once you became a full costumer? Yeah, I think um, I started when there still was, you know, you kind of, I was an intern, and then I was a PA, and then I became an assistant designer. You know, it was, it was sort of we followed a, a system, and now it's a little bit different. People kind of get in in all different sorts of ways. But I really, I'm, I'm so happy that I did it that way. I learned a lot from I worked primarily with this woman named Marie France who's a fantastic designer and she did all her own sketches and so I learned a process kind of like an old school process of how you um, do your research and then conceptualize and then do drawings and kind of go back and forth with your visuals and so I, I kind of still approach it the same way you know I feel like I, I was taught by someone she's also French she's European so she has like a really artistic way of approaching um, not just because she's French, but I, I was really happy to learn from her, you mm -hmm. know? And I worked with a couple of other people too, but primarily I, I worked with her as an assistant for, for some years, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I wanted to follow up too, like, so we were talking out there, your humble beginnings are from, if I, if I remember, Minnesota, mm -hmm. did you say? Yep. Okay, yep. so you're growing up in Minnesota, uh, and what was the seed for you? Like, did you go to school for, mm -hmm. did you go to school for design mm -hmm. and did you have a goal to, to, to work in Hollywood as a costume designer because I usually find that people like their paths like they want to go over here but then they mm -hmm. end up mm -hmm. doing this 
How did it work out for well, you? Well, I, st I started out as an English major in, in <laughs> Minneapolis, and but I, I knew I always wanted to go to art school, but I didn't really, I mean, I thought my family expected me to do something different. So I did, I did move out here, and then I went to art school, and I studied fine arts. Um, but I think I, I discovered pretty early on. I mean, if I look back, I mean, my sister and my cousins, they say that I used to dress them up all the time when we were kids. I'm like, you're right, I did, <laughs> I did. <laughs> we have pictures to prove it. Um, I think I knew pretty early on that this is what I wanted to do. I mean, I started really, I think the first thing I designed, I was 27. Wow. So I just, I got right to it. That was a couple of years ago. A so, few. <laughs> so, a few. But how did you, all right, so then how did you make the leap? Like, what was the first, you know, if, if not stop or my mom will shoot? Uh, and I also believe another really underappreciated movie at that time, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah, that was great. Um, yeah. So and we're talking the movie, mm -hmm. not not mm -hmm. not the oh, yeah. television. No, I worked on the movie. It, yeah, I was the so. assistant on that movie too. And so, how did you get how did you get your foot in the door to to start the whole career process? You go to school and then. Well, I think um, it's. I don't think this has changed much. I think if you want to be a designer. Uh, you, you have to really you know put that out there loud and clear and there's a lot of low budget small you know art films or projects of a friend or you know people do AFI films of, mm. a friend of mine and I actually did the costumes for an AFI film together it was Carl Franklin's senior project um, yeah. I know they don't have a costume design uh, program right. at AFI so they kind of cast a net out to young designers who want to have a crack at it and so I think actually right during the Buffy I worked on a really small budget movie that is buried it was called Doppelganger okay. and it was Drew Barrymore right Avi Nusher directed it and it was a bit of a sci-fi thing and um so it was me and two other people making a dollar and we worked our butts off and you know that was that's kind of it that's what you have to do you have to you know you have to ask yourself would I do this for free right and then sometimes you do. Yep. And then, you know, if you're any good at it, it starts to catch on. You know? And then flash forward, here we are talking, you're, you're, you're part of a, a franchise now, and you've worked well, let's in see. your costume yeah. designer. And yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, was, and if uh, let's, I mean, I kind of hope they do another one, actually, because that was the triple uh, X you're talking yes, about. Yes, triple X. I do hope they do another one, because um, I think I found a, a, a great groove with... I was talking to a friend last night who's also a costume designer. She's like, I hate stunts. I'm like, I love stunts. I want to do another movie with stunts. Uh -huh. I mean, it was fantastic. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot just in that that I want to kind of follow up with. But I guess I'll start with um, with this. But in terms of stunts, right, um, you know, how do you approach it in terms of costuming? Because, you know, to, I, I kind of think about it in that sense. And, you know, if you're doing these various stunts, mm -hmm. the, the material's got to be able to Absolutely. move and still look good. <clears throat> Absolutely. You, I mean, are there multiple versions of it? And yep. to what degree? Can you explain? Yeah, I think, you know, that also depends on the budget of the movie. So in this one in particular, um, I was really lucky because we had a decent budget. And I could approach it in, it's a very stylized movie anyway. So I wanted to start with how do they look? Let's let's not worry about does it move yet. So let's just pick what looks great for this character and this style. And then we altered everything. I mean, I talked about this before where um, we got all this, we found a really great stretch fabric and we dyed it in every color. And we just kept adding panels to everything so that uh, people could move, you know, because they do a lot of punching and kicking and jumping. And so each each actor had their own type of movement, and we would um, adjust accordingly, you know. And it turned it, it turned into kind of a great style thing as well, because sometimes you could see the panels, and we liked the way it looked, so we ended up doing it in a bunch of things, like um, especially for the women. Well, for Vin too, we we uh, because when you then when you add these stretch panels, it it makes everything fit really well and tight, and it stays really tight no matter what the movement is. Mm -hmm. So it ended up being. Um, like a twofold bonus, you know, because it they could move, but then they also just always looked, you know. And I liked it. That was sort of funny. It's like he just flew through the air and landed on a moving bus, but he looks great you know, <laughs> because his stuff is still really tight and fits, you know. Gotcha. So, 
And I also, you know, in, in terms of this cast, um, it's a very multicultural cast. It is. And so you talked, you know, you would pick a look for each of the characters. But, but can you talk about that? Because, you know, I think that's one of the great things about this movie. And, and, and um, I think that Vin's also trying to do with his other movies, whether mm -hmm. it's Fast and the Furious, mm -hmm. is he has that multicultural aspect of it and, and brings it forth. Yeah, he screen. really, he does. I mean, I, I, it's part of how he lives, too. I mean, it's his company, One Race Films, his his life. It's just, it's really natural for him that there's people, it, it feels really comfortable and, and every, you know, it's also beautiful, you know, there's all people from, so it, that, that, there wasn't even talk about it. It was just, this is what we're doing. And um, so I thought it looked really, I loved that part of it because also, you know, like Donnie Yen is from China and he's done so many martial arts movies. So he, he has a certain way of doing things. You know, Dipika is one of the biggest, um, Padukan, she's one of the biggest stars in India. I think probably the biggest Bollywood star. So, you know, they each came with their own method that they already had done things a certain way, but this was their first American movie like this. So I really stuck to that and wanted them to have a real kind of American street style. Um, and that's where we started. So we just, I, I made everyone, I, I kind of stuck to their style and then, you know, we would have to have fittings where they would kick or like, you know, Dipika does the splits or, you know, where they would do their action and just adjust the clothes. And so, you know, in a movie like this, there's also, you know, sometimes 10 of something, sometimes four, sometimes, you know, for Vin, cause his stunts are so extensive, sometimes there'd be 20 of something. And, you know, yes, one is more stretchy for doing the stunt or one has to have, you know, holes cut in the back for the harnesses. And so he, he had a trailer all to himself with, you know, these are, everything had to be sectioned off. Like this is the, this is the harness outfit. <clears throat> this is the fighting outfit. This is the skiing outfit. You know, each one had to be altered and sometimes even made out of different materials. You know, he goes in the water, he's on the motorcycle. He's, a, he's doing quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, so we had to have different shoes for, for each stunt. And, you know, it's, um, it's a puzzle, mm -hmm. you know. So the good thing is I have OCD, so I was like, that was natural. Yeah, I had read uh, you had uh, done this fine interview from Forbes, and you were going off, uh, you, you had said you'd lot, used a lot of Burberry, John Rovedo's, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, some Michael Kors. So... We were talking uh, prior to the interview. I'd worked in a costume department yeah. in contact, so I sort of have a, a feel as to like the vastness of it. Um, mm -hmm. Going using actual, you know, Burberry clothing, mm -hmm. using like realistic clothing. But then there was the other side of it where they had to literally design clothing yes. uh, because it <clears throat> may not have a it didn't exist yep. or b it just it's what they had in mind for the character that you couldn't find in a store so that yep. you know they would design a dress or something yep. so it seems like, and then there were a lot of costume warehouses yep. which you would pull from mm -hmm. what was the ratio in in triple it, the, the, the triple x the return of Xander cage of actually getting burberry clothes mm -hmm. and then creating mm -hmm. like something you know, it, again, every movie has their own personality, and on this one, just the nature of it, it's a huge cast, and people were arriving uh, sometimes two days before they were shooting. So we bought, you know, probably 80% of the clothes. We made all the, we made, we, so I'd say 80% 80, 80 on this one. I wanted, I approached it, I wanted to make uh, more. But what I did is ha I had a I worked with Greg Lauren a lot too in LA and he made specific things for Vin. Mm -hmm. It's like we, we like we like this, but let's make it for him. Right. Let's make it um, so that it's his size, you know, because he's tall and you know in good shape and and also to what we needed. Like we would add um, say stretch panels in the knee or or things that allowed him to move. So I would say we really I don't think there was one piece of clothing on any of these actors that wasn't modified. Okay. So we really spent m most of our brain work and our craftspeople were working constantly on modifying mm -hmm. the clothes. We did have to, we had to make up, um, it's sort of a, a, a unit of the military, but it doesn't exist. Right. So we made all those jumpsuits for them, you know, when um, Tony Collette is on the aircraft carrier and they're, um, what, what were they called? Uh, other 
government agency, OGA. Uh -huh. So, you know, we made that up based on kind of a vintage military style, and we found this great fabric that is not military, but it looks military and looked pretty in the room. And so, you know, we had to make all of those. And I did make a few things, you know, for different people. So, sure. But, yeah, we, we mostly really just cut them up and put them back together. Oh. Something else I found very interesting in that article, because you mentioned something that I knew, jewelry, mm -hmm. as part of costuming, mm -hmm. but you also mentioned tattoos, mm -hmm. which I I always assumed, uh, because there were no tattoos that I can recall in contact, <laughs> was, yeah. but I had always assumed that tattoos would come from a makeup department, because they would have to they print it on, and mm -hmm. that would be like mm -hmm. concept design, but... Mm -hmm. You mentioned it, so it comes out of costumes. I, I, I didn't no, know it that. No, is, it is the makeup department, <clears throat> but um, we worked together because it, uh, you know, these characters have so many tattoos that it becomes part of their look. Mm. So, um, you know, we, we talked about it in the beginning, but, you know, Vin really, um, he created his tattoos and we knew what they were pretty early on. So I was able to kind of build off of that. Um, and maybe pull some symbolism or what, what is your look, you know, what does that do for your look? But then when the other actors arrived, we did definitely talk about it and collaborate. And um, I think also sometimes the actors meet me first and we talk about their character and, the, and, and what, what, how's this person going to look? So we have to feed their, you know, to what the tattoos look like into that. Okay. Yeah. And what is it like going into, because you weren't um, there for the first two movies, nope. um, so you're kind of going into this franchise. What, what's the difference of starting a movie from scratch versus now you're coming into a franchise and there's a sort of a pre-built look and mm -hmm. a feel to mm -hmm. it? Well, I've never, actually, this, was, this is my first time being involved in a franchise. So I just approached it um, like I would any other movie. You know, it's... The, of course, we had to look at the first triple X because Vin is Xander and he's in that one, and and I had seen it when it came out, um, but because he's still the same character, you know, we had to really study uh, who that guy was and where would he be 14 years later. Um, but I, I, again, I I think I've said this before, but I was really lucky. I mean, I felt like the characters were really well written and explained on the page, mm -hmm. and then our director was also really clear. You know, it's like. Um, he had it already in his head, you know, none of them are going to be the same. None of, the, you know, I was like, at one point I was like, okay, how am I going to make, you know, Donnie Yen and Tony Jocks, they're both martial artists, like, uh, uh, if, are they, we have to make sure they don't have the same style, because they have a lot of similar um, martial arts crossover. And, and in the end, it was like, we, nobody looked the same. And so I just really approached it from... How do I want these guys to look? I want them to look amazing in every scene, and I want it to be a little over the top, like fashion-wise. You know, I don't. This isn't the kind of movie where some movies you you look at. Um, you want to make them very realistic. Well, none of this is realistic. So, <laughs> you know, why can't they look amazing when they're doing these amazing stunts? So, um, you know, and none of the other characters are in the other. Well, there's Gibbons, and then you know, there's the one that I can't say because it's a spoiler. But there are only two other characters. Um, everybody else is new. So I really, I was lucky I got to start from scratch, you know? So, so starting from scratch, so you sit down with DJ Caruso for the mm -hmm. first time. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the director. Yep. How does that conversation go? Uh, like, what do you, does he have, is it is it collaborative, mm -hmm. or does he have like a certain set of ideas he's like okay this is how i want to break this scene down and i want yes. this character to look like this 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 and you take marching orders or you go oh yeah that's a great idea how about we do this like how collaborative or how like does the director direct you because yeah, he's got to direct everybody he's he's the boss <clears throat> you know i and i again because i grew up old school i mean i work for the director right. so um in this case you know vin is also a producer and very attached to this character so um, we we were lucky uh, DJ had um, already you know he'd been on the project obviously longer than me and he had done a lot of visual research and we we connected in in a lot of what we saw as sort of the vibe of Xander right. and we talked about Zhang you know a lot um, and how you know we would want them to be different but also kind of the same and um, so absolutely, um, and then you know things just went so fast. Yeah. So it was kind of like, do you like these pictures? And we just had to really go at a very, very uh, fast pace. 
but because we had had our initial many, many meetings, and he's very attentive, you know, where I would bring tons of uh, research and, and pictures to show him, and we would weed out what we liked and what we didn't like, and that was our map. Mm -hmm. So um, I felt like as long as I stayed true to the map, then I could also have my leeway. But I definitely brought him uh, choices, right. you know. Yeah, it was very. It's very collaborative, you know. It's, um, but he is ultimately the boss. Yep. Like even if I love something and I'm madly in love with it, and he doesn't love it, out it goes. Oh. Yeah. So, and and Vin had a lot of input um, for his character as well. And uh, his sister is also um, producer, and she's she runs his production company. So you know we had to we had to have a little consortium, you know. Of, bosses does it get difficult sometimes mm -hmm. in that respect yep. in that regard yep because some people you know just don't agree no matter what yep. you know they it's you have to be a diplomat and a psychiatrist as well as a designer yeah did, did you ever get the go ask your father oh god yeah. <laughs> like oh yeah and then they go well go ask your mother oh, yeah, <laughs> it's like okay you just absolutely. feel like the little kid that's like you two hash it out and, yeah <laughs> well sometimes you can't be in the same location you right. know because we had different things happening at different times you know we had two units going almost all the time so it was kind of like go find dj and then go <laughs> find vin and sam and then you know so and also, um, you know, Joe Roth and Jeff Kirschenbaum and Zach Roth, you know, these are really strong producers that wanted to be in on it as well. And But they were they were amazing. I mean, I have to say this group were, you know, gentlemen and ladies, you know, they behaved like grown-ups. That's great to hear. Yeah. Doesn't happen all the time. No, <laughs> it doesn't. No, but it did here. They were, they were <clears throat> lovely grown-ups. Great. Yeah. So w w uh, you just mentioned um, with several crews shooting at all at the same time. So where do you kind of, um, what's, for lack of a better term, where's your battle station? Um, we were, again, we were lucky on this. It's different all the time. And sometimes I have to be in two places at once, which is impossible, but somehow you do it. Um, I, uh, we were shooting in Toronto mostly, and the Pinewood stages up there are fantastic. So we had our offices at the stage, uh, at one of the stages, and then we would have sometimes two or three stages um, simultaneously um, because we had to have sets built and permanent sets so you kind of you know it's like all right I'm going over to stage eight now and then I got to go to stage three and so you just you, it's a constant constant movement mm -hmm. um, and I had a great crew up there so you know there's like somebody's in charge of extras but I'll come in in the beginning and dress the extras with them and then I have to go you know, then say, you know, Tony Collette's arriving and we don't know what coat she's wearing yet, so now I gotta go over to her trailer. And for the most part, we were incredibly lucky that we were in one place. Mm -hmm. You know, the stages, the offices, the production office, the art department, all the actors' trailers, everything was at Pinewood. And then, of course, when you go on location, you know, that all goes to hell in a handbasket because <laughs> you're like trying to figure out where everybody is and where's the set. And, and then we shot in the Dominican Republic, and that was tricky logistically as well. But for the, the bulk of the filming, we were all together, and I, it's kind of like that's how that miracle happened. You know, mm -hmm. that's how we were able to really pull everything off, and I was able to pay attention to everything because we were in this great camp, you know, and that doesn't always happen either. But I think with movies like this where there's a lot of stunts and there's a lot of, you know, visual effects, um, it is a lot on stage. So. Yeah. So that's how you can pull that off, you know. Um, if that would have been all location, more locations, I don't, I don't know. We'd be having a different conversation. Um, <clears throat> how big was your, how big was the, the, the costume department? How big was your crew? It was big. Um, I think we had about 30 permanent people and we probably broke 45 sometimes. Right, and it, it, two of the most fascinating things um, that I recall, uh, there was this one woman uh, on, on contact. I believe mm -hmm. her name was Robin. Um, she all she did sketches. Yep. <clears throat> sketch artist. So, so did you yeah. have a sketch artist yeah. on hand as well? We did. Um, actually, that was an interesting. Um, I had a sketch artist. I did a lot of the prep here in LA. Okay. Before we went to Toronto, because um, Vin is based here, and DJ was based here, and um, Tony Collette. Couple couple people were here. So we did what we could here, and also to be honest, um, as far as like costume houses and manufacturing, I mean we we have a really great base right. for all that here. So 
Um, my sketch artist was here, and so we did our initial sketches. And then they don't, it's funny, they don't, um, in Toronto, they don't work that way. They don't mm -hmm. have a sketch artist on the team, and that was something I was working with them, saying, you guys really need this. Um, so mm -hmm. I had to work with um, the illustrator, our concept illustrator, who was unbelievable. He did some sketches for me, and then I would kind of have to steal people from the art department to really? do sketches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I can draw, but not... Uh, I can literally sketch, but nowadays um, they want like these really uh, fully rendered uh, computer <laughs> illustrations. So that is a whole, you know, that really, really, really needs. And some movies have, you know, two or three. Uh huh. Right. So I had to kind of paste that together a little bit. That was if I go to Toronto again, I'll insist that they have a sketch artist on that. So okay, so the other cool thing was. <clears throat> And again, it, it was just something I never know when I'm watching a movie. Um, people, even that, that, that woman I described and other costumers, uh, there was a pair of shoes or something. So they'd get the pair of shoes. They're brand new sneakers or whatever. They don't need to look. They, they can't look brand new. So you have somebody, even yourself, Stressing. might distress them. Yeah. Like yeah. with sandpaper and kicking them in yep. mud. So you had a lot of, there, yep. was there a lot of that going on? Absolutely. We had um, two full-time, they, they're called now fabric artists. Fabric artists. Because oh, they don't, so. it's age or dire. It used to be age or dire. And because they're doing much more than aging and dying. <clears throat> they're sometimes airbrushing something to look like, you know, you've been out in the desert for a week. Right. Or um, like um, there is there is a scene where we, we first meet Ruby Rose's character and she's in the Serengeti. And she's in kind of a grass suit hiding. So we made that. And we, um, the guys had gone on a scout and they brought us back some of the grass so that we could match the exact color. Okay. Because we were doing this in Toronto and that was going to be shot actually in the Dominican Republic for Africa. So we had to, you know, make that and paint it and, and age it. And so, um, yeah, we had a, one full time and another, her kind of assistant um, or another age or dyer. And then we had to bring in other people too for um, just, and I do a lot of, I, li I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So I do some distressing and painting and stuff myself. But on a movie that size, there's just, you have to, you have to have someone doing that full time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, Seems it so. is interesting. People don't realize. No. Uh, no, not at all. I, I found it fascinating. I was like, what are you doing with those boots? She yeah. Goes, oh, no. You, like, you have to wa like Jodie Foster's character yeah. is walking through a jungle. Yep. They can't look like they just nope. came off the rack. And I was like, nope. Makes sense. Yep. But it's a detail that, again, now it's a detail that I look for. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I, I never... Yeah. Had I not done that job for yeah. the nine months that I was fortunate enough to do it, That's it really was fascinating. That's really great that you did that. Because now was. you know that people don't just show up to work already dressed. And well, it was, <laughs> it was the best thing. It was one of the best times I've had mm -hmm. uh, working in Los Angeles. And I take the memories with me. But That's great. But going with you, well, let's talk about how many seamstresses. Because there was always two, a seamstress on yeah. hand to either stitch something together. You said mm -hmm. you modified. Or... Oh my God! Uh, Vin Diesel just ripped his. How yep. do you pronounce these jeans? D D Dacker too? I, I don't know. I'm not a. Oh, D squared. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> what, there yeah, you go. he likes D squared. So yeah, that's a, and so like oh, he just he just uh, he just ripped his D squared jeans. Like no, you do. You gotta have somebody on hand yep. to. Well, he had a dedicated costumer, and she knew how to sew. So right. that to me is important when you're taking care of a guy who's doing that many stunts that you have at least basic knowledge where if an emergency happens, because what if you're in the middle of the jungle and and you're <laughs> not close to the trailer where yeah. so we had you have a cutter fitter who is someone who can draft a pattern and who's like the mathematician artist. And then we had um, so we had a cutter fitter and probably four or five seamstresses sometimes. Right. Um, and you know more or less according to what we were doing, but that was that was a whole department in itself. That was right. really our uh, department that I counted on that and the aging and dying. It was um, because you know the other thing is you know Vin wears these boots. We ha we actually had the boots made, but he has to have ten pairs. So and then they're all aged to look the same. Right. And then maybe you pull some out for another scene where they get more distressed. So now you have to have about three or four of those. Okay. So it's um, because the other thing is it has to look the same for a long period of time. You don't often finish a scene in one day. You have to do some of it today, some of it in two weeks, some of it in four weeks. And so 
you know, our team has to keep the continuity of, okay, those are the really distressed boots in this scene, so that goes right, that connects right to that, so now he has to wear those. So, you know, all his clothes had, had slight variations of distress uh, in some of the bigger stunt scenes. So it's, you know, <laughs> that's, it's a lot of people, yeah. you know, maintaining, making, fixing, maintaining. It's, in it's continuity, because if those boots get destroyed, yeah, then like, they have in, to retire the shot, them. It's like okay, they're done. Yep. It's like in oh damn, if we yep. don't, we better have had all our shots done. Yep. Because we don't have them. And I was again really lucky. I, this crew in Toronto had done other large films, so they they knew that you can't. They couldn't just come to me last minute right. and say, "Oh, we're out of boots." You know, we had to know constantly. How are those doing? How are those pants doing? Um, how many more do you think we need? And, you know, so we, we actually, you know, maybe I changed that percentage because a lot of end stuff was made. Um, you know, we had to keep adding mm -hmm. and making. and um, Get to have those d squared jeans. More, well, the <laughs> those were, he didn't wear those in a lot of stunts. He actually wore these great canvas um, pants that Greg Lauren made for us. He wore those in a lot. A lot of and some other obscure designers, but yeah, we he had a lot of everything. I bet. I mean, crazy a lot, you know. Oh yeah, he's the hero. <laughs> yeah, and look at what I mean. If you try to, if it's it's hard to even remember all the stuff that he even just in when you first see him in that scene, jumping off the water tower, skiing, and then skateboarding, and then I mean, it's running across the tops of buildings, and I mean, it's already it hits mm. you right over the head. <clears throat> so yeah, a lot of stunts. Um, I want to ask sort of one last question because I know we do got to wrap this up. But um, Maria Menounos is, um, you know, she's sort of the head of uh, Popcorn Talk Network here. Mm -hmm. And Vin is a very close friend of hers, and oh, I've been great. lucky enough to uh, to meet him through her. Oh, good. Um, and I know he's a very visual person. So Absolutely. I want to go back to sort of, you know, your interactions <clears throat> with him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how was that? Because I know he, any time you bring in sketches, his yep. face just oh, lights yeah, up. Yeah. It's and he true. reacts. He loves it. Can, can you sort of go into detail of like yep. what that was like? Yeah, and, and again, I feel so lucky because that's how I communicate. And uh, you're, we are expected to put visuals into words a lot. And I find myself sometimes getting tongue tied because I can see it in my head and I know exactly what it should look like or what I would want it to look like. Now, how do you describe that to a person who only deals, you know, with words or audially, say? Mm -hmm. um, so our first really, we, we met and it wasn't going to be our first meeting. It wasn't going to be a fitting. And I said, why don't I just bring some things to show him so he knows what my taste is or whatever? And he responded. And it was like, you don't have to, you don't have to do a fitting. Let's just look at jackets because I know they're going to be really important. So he tried on some coats and we had fun. And I brought some outrageous things just to kind of break the ice and and we had fun and then the next time I went to meet him he had the whole uh, storyline of the movie visually pasted up around the room so you could go chronologically mm -hmm. and it was research sketches um, concepts and it was like wow this is amazing so then we rearranged our racks like okay there's the skateboarding let's put all the skateboarding clothes over there on a rack so that it was so he had the visual and it's like even if you don't want to try all these things on look at how these pants and these t-shirts and these boots look for that mm -hmm. so we kind of tried to match his um order the chronology of yeah, yeah and uh so i felt i mean at the time i don't even re i don't think i realized how lucky that was because it was just <clears throat> unspoken, you know? It was like, mm -hmm. oh, oh my God, I don't have to describe it. I can just <laughs> point to the picture and say, look at this, you know, look how great. And so then we could just have fun because I think um, we clicked into that. And, and yeah, when I would, was trying to come up with some concepts for him, uh, our, our sketch artist drew, you know, really good computer renderings of him in the various things that we were trying to show him. And yeah, he loved it. He really responded. So I think that's great. I mean, um, you know, I never heard of that before in terms of seeing it visually. And I, I think that's a, you know, I don't know if you've done that before, but I just love the idea that if you just go down the entire costume, yeah. yep. you can see it from start to finish yeah. in terms of just costumes. You that's know, great. you have to you have to do that uh, differently with each person mm -hmm. and each project. And luckily, I mean, I feel um, looking back, it's DJ works that way and Vin works that way. Or you know, the truth is maybe 
Finn works differently in on de different movies, but this is how we all approached it on this. And I think it would have been a lot harder if we weren't also visual. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really looking back, huge, huge blessing that that all came together. Yeah. And fun. I mean, <laughs> it's like, great. This is what I love to do. So. Yeah. I have uh, I, I have two like wrap up sort of final questions. Uh, in an interview I had read, you had said you had equated costume designing, costuming to like math, solving mm -hmm. a math problem. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, so Neil Peart, who's a drummer for Rush, mm -hmm. he equates his drumming, he uses math. Mm -hmm. I can see that because he's using beats, one, two, three, sure. countermanding beats, and I sure. get there's, there's a numbers, and I suck at math, so that would make me a bad drummer. But I, where are the numbers in costuming? Like, well, does... it's it's also for me. It's funny that I, I realized that a few projects ago <clears> that <throat> there's that there's math. You know, there's we have a budget, we have X amount of days, you have X amount of people, and rather than you know, okay, I've got the visuals, they're happening. I, I in my and now I got to figure out how to describe it or show it. But there's also uh, this scene is coming up in four days, and that scene is coming up in two weeks, and that. So it's it's there's this amount of space and this amount of people, and right. it does become physics or math, because that's what you have. Okay. So now you gotta work backwards from that. Like, you you must, in order to complete this task, you know, fill this space with the exact <coughs> right amount of people, costumes, things, time. Right. Okay. So it's also sometimes when you're dealing with producers and uh, people who don't think just visually. I figured that would be more politics. It's, <laughs> you know, if you speak to them in terms of math and physics and, and let them know that I do have an understanding of that, you know, it's, it's how do I say to them, okay, this is the, this is the number, this is what it's going to cost, trust me. You have to do some math to show right. them that you do know how to do that. You know, it costs this much money to dress these many people. And there's a ton of math, sadly. Yeah. But Counting. if you sure. just, yeah, okay. if you just embrace it, it, it right. doesn't become, you know, because math wasn't my perfect subject either in school. Um, I'd rather draw a picture or read a story or write, right. you know, tell, have somebody tell me a story. But um, you do, it is, it is a, a big part of our job that you at least somewhat conceptually grasp mm -hmm. that there is a physics. You right. Know? So it's, you can't change it. Interesting. So in this other article that I had read about you, um, you were quoted as saying that working, um, Working on Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage, and here's the quote. Uh, you, quote, felt like a kid again. <laughs> um, Why? Like, what made you feel like a kid again working on Triple X, The Return yeah. of Xander Cage? Um, that's funny. I'm not, I, I think I probably said something like that, but I, I did, um, well, Vin, first of all, has fun. And that's how he approached, this character is wild and mm -hmm. fun and... Uh, certainly not cautious and just right out there and so he would by the time you know he controlled that vibe on the set and he had other people having fun with him and I think it's also him being in that character it just it, it bled out to the rest of the crew and the stages and the sets and the so because I was allowed to have fun, I mean, I have to be somewhat serious. Like they have to know that I'm actually going to show up on time and you know do my job and not right. act like a crazy person. So, but because Vin has fun and everybody around him and the actors were having fun, I felt like I was allowed to just be kind of part of that team. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a completely serious person all the time, so I was happy to be allowed you know, to do that. Yeah. Very cool. Um, it was it was a pleasure spending time with you. Thank you. Um, it was it was very informative. Um, where can uh, people sort of uh, n do, you, do you have Twitter? Do you have uh, where people can kind of see? Um, I have a website, have a and website. Uh, that was just updated. I'm, I think it looks great. Um, I did just start doing Instagram because my nieces forced me, to do it. <laughs> and they said I was really out of it, and they want to see pictures. We so I started doing Instagram. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as my work stuff, it's really my website. I think has. Well. It kind of explains. Always on yeah. it, uh, if not yesterday, the day before. Yeah, yeah, it's looking good. I'm missing a few things, but you know, it's a good. I, I like. I like the way it looks. I think. Awesome. It, yeah. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, and I wanted to thank you too, because uh, it's very informative. Uh, good. I love uh, being able to talk with people and, and let the audience know what it 
a lot of people just don't know. I know. And one thing that's very striking, because I've worked in distribution mm -hmm. for a majority of, of mm -hmm. my meager career, and when I worked in production, like, production has no idea how distribution works. Like, they have no idea. Right. Um, so they don't know what it takes to get a trailer up on screen. They just think, oh, it just magically yeah, happens. exactly. Or how the, the movie actually gets into theaters. On the flip side of that, mm -hmm. <clears throat> distribution has no idea yep. of the daunting tasks that production has, whether That's it true. be hitting a deadline or whether it's like distressing clothes or they don't understand fully get that collaborative uh, uh, work and, and what it takes and the deadlines and the budgets and like because yep. they're always like, when are we getting... You know, from a studio standpoint, it's when are we getting the print? Yep. When are we getting this? From from yeah. the production standpoint, it's like, hey, we're, we're working as best we can. Yeah, and, everybody's uh, concerned with their uh, particular task, but I think um, there are some good producers who have understanding and share information, yes. and that's really the best thing you can hope for is when someone lets you know, well, why do I have to do this so quickly? Well, it's because, you know, marketing needs this right now. Otherwise, you know, it's the, the trickle down thing. You know, we all need <laughs> each other, but, you know, you have to pay attention to um, that you're not the only person involved, you know. And I think the costume department, we know that because we have right. to deal with everybody. Yeah. But. Well, thank you so much uh, once again. And for, uh, for more information, follow us at the Popcorn Talk. Check out other Anatomy of Movies. And um, it was, once again, it was a pleasure to thank have you. you. Kimberly thank A. You. Tillman. Thank you. Um, until next time. Thank Bye, you guys. Fans. Thanks. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie.